The image of Prince Charles fighting it out on the polo field is a familiar one. For a man under conflicting pressures, particularly in his personal life, polo is a vital outlet for his frustrations. I, Charles, Prince of Wales. Ever since his investiture as Prince of Wales at 18, his driving need to prove himself a worthy heir, find a role and fulfill his destiny has dominated his life. It's been a lonely wait. As a young man, the thought of finding the right wife to share his burden was a major preoccupation. When you marry, in my position, you're going to marry somebody who perhaps one day is going to become queen. And you've got to choose somebody very carefully, I think, who, who can fulfill this particular role. Because people like you, perhaps, would expect quite a lot from somebody like that. And it's got to be somebody pretty special. The fairy tale princess miraculously appeared, but now the romantic image is shattered. Charles is no longer the Prince Charming of every girl's dreams. The announcement that the royal couple are to separate has brought the whole future of the British monarchy into question. People expect royalty to set an example of family values, but the pressure of fulfilling the world's dream of the perfect marriage has proved too much. The mystique is shattered, and Charles stands accused of being selfish and uncaring as a husband and father. As a man caught between an unhappy marriage and the demands of public duty, he's turned to an old girlfriend for support. Charles's status as a future king is now clouded in uncertainty. As the first Prince of Wales to publicly admit a failed marriage, he now has to face a disillusioned public and a monarchy in crisis. It all began with the publication of the book Diana, Her True Story, in which the projected image of the united, happy family was revealed as a sham. With his marriage problems catapulted into the public arena, Charles became convinced of his wife's complicity. This only soured their relationship further. Well, I think Prince Charles has become very disillusioned with his wife and her circle um, because of their perceived cooperation or Diana's perceived cooperation with the book. He hasn't read the book. Extracts have been read to him by his friends. And um, as far as he's concerned, he, can, he thinks it's Diana's behind it. I've always said from the word go that Diana has had nothing to do with the uh, publication of this book. I hear that he's not a happy man, that he's become rather short-tempered with everybody. Uh, I mean, how do you ever recover from such treachery, which is what it amounts to, really? But the royal show has to go on. Appearances of unity have to be maintained, as on this official visit to Korea just prior to the breakup. Retiring to lick his wounds has never been an option for the Prince of Wales. It's not in his nature to hide from the spotlight. Charles has never known a life without it. After 40 years, he's used to being the center of attention. Everything has always revolved around him. With every practical need taken care of, his path continuously smoothed. He knows little of the struggles common to everyday life. Prince Charles basically hasn't altered his bachelor habits. He's, if Queen Victoria came back today, she would look on with approval at Prince Charles because he goes fox, fox hunting, he goes shooting, he goes fishing. He performs all the aristocratic pursuits that Edward VII, his Prince of Wales predecessor, did. Um, he has very, he's changed his life very little since marriage, and I think that's one of the problems. Diana's and Diana's friends see him as a selfish father, an uncaring husband, and a man who puts his own pursuits and his own interests before those of his family. He's also something of a martinet, which I think he gets from his father. He's a very hard taskmaster. He likes things done properly and exactly, and he doesn't suffer fools gladly. I think under all of it, there's quite a strong streak of arrogance in Charles, in that uh, although you'll see him being extremely holding himself back very much in public. There's a sense about Charles that he knows what is right and he knows or thinks that what he's doing is right. And I think that does alienate a lot of people. Prince Charles basically was brought up by nannies and by the Queen Mother. And it is interesting that the two role models that he's had have been the Queen Mother and his own mother, the Queen. The Queen Mother is both a symbol before she's a mother. So it's a very, I think a Jungian psychologist would have a field day looking at this man who can only fulfill himself as an individual when his mother dies. 
Once his mother became queen, Charles had to endure a childhood of conflicting demands. On the one hand, he had to perform ceremonial duties with the aloofness befitting his high position. On the other, he was sent away to boarding school and expected to roll along with everyone else. It was a schizophrenic existence, not helped by his parents' choice of Gordonston in the Scottish Highlands, where its founder, Kurt Hahn, enforced a Spartan regime. He's a, a sensitive man, and he was a sensitive child. And it, that is not the place for sensitive souls. It's a rough, tough, physical sort of school. He learned a lot from it, and the Kurt Hahn ethic of there is more in you was, was good. But Charles could never be called a wimp. In his teens, he chose to take up polo, determined to prove his strength, fitness, and courage in this robust and dangerous sport. Family tradition is steeped in horsemanship. His increasing obsession with polo revealed a deep need to make his own mark. Polo is a release, and I think it's also one way in which he can compete with his father. He would never admit to competing with Prince Philip. It's a subconscious thing. But Prince Philip is very much the macho man, or was the macho man, though that wasn't the phrase that was used 30 or 40 years ago when he was playing polo and doing all the sporting things that Prince Philip used to love to do, all the, if you like, the masculine pastimes that, that he does. I think rarely that, uh, that polo is a release. It's also something that it's totally physical. He can let himself go, and uh, he, he loves horses. He likes anything on four legs anyway. Uh, but I think subconsciously, it's a way in which he can show his father that he's as good a man as he was. Philip made no secret of his disappointment in Charles. He felt Princess Anne showed the forthright, resilient character he would have liked in his eldest son. Charles is cut from a very different cloth and this has made things difficult between them. Charles had a very bad relationship with his father. His father bullied him, he cut the ground from under him, he made him feel small, which meant that Charles was a very slow developer emotionally. He had no self-esteem whatsoever. Charles found a more sympathetic ear in his great uncle, Lord Louis Mountbatten. This charismatic older figure, once the last Viceroy of India, decided to step in and nurture this hesitant adolescent, as well as groom him in statesmanship. As someone who gave him the confidence to believe in himself, Charles lent heavily on him for advice and support. It was a very special relationship. Charles could tell him anything, and he knew that he would never be ridiculed. He would tell him things that he was afraid to tell his own father, because his father might say, oh God, grow up, be a man, you know, don't tell me things like that. And Charles, for example, would never be frightened to cry, never be afraid to cry in, in, in front of Mountbatten, because he knew that Mountbatten would always be sympathetic. In 1979, Lord Mountbatten was suddenly and tragically murdered by an IRA bomb while on holiday in Ireland. For Charles, it was as if he'd lost his own father. It had a cataclysmic um, effect upon Prince Charles. He was totally so devastated. It took him many, many, many months to be e able even to, to talk about, um, uh, about Earl Mountbatten without breaking down. Within two years of Mountbatten's death, Charles was married in the fairy tale wedding of the century. If his great uncle had lived, his choice of bride might have been very different. I think that's. Diana would not have been what he would have wanted. I think at the time of the marriage, the warning signs for someone as bright as he was would have been there. He would have taken one side and said, I don't think this is right. The heir to the throne in this country ought to marry someone who had some idea of what was going to happen. He should have married someone from one of the European royal families, Hohenzollerns, Habsburgs or whatever, someone who knew what it was about. I think that had Mountbatten been around, he would have said, have a fling with her, in, enjoy a lovely relationship, but this is not the one you should marry. This is not going to be um, a soulmate for you for the years to come. But Charles's other great confidant, his grandmother, was keen to see him marry. The Queen Mother has been a major influence on him from an early age. She was a substitute mother while the Queen spent long periods away on official duties. It's a close relationship based on warmth and humor. She's a very strong personality, a very strong character. And she is someone who has, in her own time, in her own way, gone through a lot of hardship, in that for a long time she was Duchess of York. She never envisaged becoming queen. With the abdication crisis, all of a sudden, her very shy, very reticent, very stammering husband, in whom we can see perhaps elements of Charles, suddenly came to the throne. And she had to be the supporting character, 
very much carrying a lot on her own shoulders there. And I think she sees in Charles a lot of what she saw in her late husband and is therefore very supportive and has a very strong affection and bond with him. In contrast, his relationship with his mother, the Queen, has never been a natural one. The demands of a monarch's official duties have separated them ever since Charles was four years old. Sometimes he didn't seem to even recognize her. But as he's grown older, these same official duties ironically brought them closer. With his mother, he has a unique bond, the sort of bond that perhaps only other monarchs have with their, their heirs. And to share that, that, that huge burden, I think that would bring you incredibly close. Although he doesn't get involved day to day in what the Queen's doing, he is the best prepared heir to the throne in history. And so uh, I think she's done a fantastic job. When Charles was 18, the Queen presented her son to the Welsh people at Carnarvon Castle, their first Prince of Wales for over 30 years. Nationalist feelings against such an investiture were running high, but Charles surprised his audience by addressing them in their own language after only six weeks' study. My energiad, wedi fy nghyfforth yn ddwys, a gallaf eich sicrhau fy mod wedi cymryd sylwi o'r gobeithion am y bwyd. Charles's impressive achievement was received as a sign that he took his title and its implications seriously. They weren't misled. When it comes to fulfilling his duty, he tries hard. For Charles, his motto, Ich dien, I serve, is no empty pledge. I think his whole being is uh, filled with a sense of duty, and it has been throughout his life. He has constantly been trying to, trying to prove himself, trying to, in some way, pay for, the, for his privilege pay the world for the position he finds himself in, repay the world. Um, and he does believe that example is important. Charles also felt the need to prove he could achieve things off his own back. He won his RAF wings in record time and revealed a daredevil attitude as well as a considerable talent for flying. Again, when he trained as a Royal Naval helicopter pilot, he completed the compulsory flying time twice as fast as his contemporaries. In the Royal Navy, he commanded his own ship at 27, two years younger than his father had. His time in the Navy was his first and only experience of living, working and relaxing in close quarters with others. He was well liked for his humor, and except for the lack of solitude, he enjoyed the experience. Off duty, he's also chosen to push himself, sometimes to the limit, he insisted on playing polo in Florida's extreme heat. The American reporter only realized half the story. Prince Charles and some British mates were playing polo against an American team in hot, muggy weather. The Englishman won as the prince led the way, but he looked a little peaked at the award ceremony and checked into a hospital last night, suffering apparently from too much sun. After a good night's sleep at the hospital, he was released today, he said he was fine now, had just been knockered out. In reality, Charles had reached a state of near exhaustion. On the way to the hospital, he registered no pulse, and for a few seconds, the heir to the throne was clinically dead. When he discharged himself after only eight hours, he drove off without a hat. His macho side again got the better of him. No one was going to see him give in to a little heat exhaustion. He was very, very adventurous. He risked his neck a million times. And we've forgotten about that now. He's become this respectable husband and father. And we don't think back to what he was, the world's most eligible bachelor, the catch of the century. Charles's celebrity status made him the most exposed royal ambassador at large, visiting more countries than any other member of the royal family. The media circus followed Charles everywhere. But at the center of all the razzmatazz and excitement, he remained a man very much alone, an isolated figure under a relentless spotlight. Even moments of relaxation were the subject of press attention. An early morning swim in Australia was interpreted to reflect his bachelor image of a man under pressure to succeed with the opposite sex. I think it made him the man who later on dived under the polar ice cap and jumped out of planes with the paras and, 
and did all those daredevil things that earned him the nickname the action man and he was always surfing with gorgeous girls throwing themselves at him and kissing him and and he did all these sort of harebrained stunts and every woman uh, wanted to either marry him or have her daughter marry him pressure was increasing for charles to follow his friend norton natchbull's example and find a bride at 31 the field had thinned out considerably over the years, he'd had a long line of girlfriends. The aphrodisiac of power had made him one of the most irresistible bachelors in the world. Some girlfriends were rejected as unsuitable. Others dropped out of the running once press interest hotted up. At 21, he'd once speculated on the type of woman he should choose. You've got to remember that when you marry, in my position, you're going to marry somebody who perhaps one day is going to become queen. And you've got to choose somebody very carefully, I think, who, who could fulfill this particular role. Because people like you, perhaps, would expect quite a lot from somebody like that. And it's got to be somebody pretty special. When he made that assessment, Lady Diana Spencer was only eight years old. Ten years later, she seemed to fit the bill perfectly. Young, beautiful, and the daughter of an English earl. Even the extreme press attention didn't appear to faze her. She handled them with a discretion beyond her years. One of the difficulties when the royal family, and it was a family decision uh, to look for a bride for the Prince of Wales, uh, was to find a girl who was suitable. They had to find one who was very young. Lady Diana Spencer was only 19, because the, what they were looking for was somebody without a past, and she, had, uh, she was positively vetted, you can be quite sure of that, and was found to have an unblemished past. For her, Charles was obviously the handsome prince of her dreams. At their engagement interview, she bubbled over with enthusiasm as she recalled their first meeting. It was 1977. Charles came to stay, his friend of my sister Sarah's, uh, for a shoot. We sort of met in a ploughed field. <laughs> well, I remember thinking what a very jolly and amusing and, and attractive 16-year-old she was. And I mean, great fun mm. and bouncy and full of life and everything. And. Um, um, I don't know what you thought of me. Pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> to begin with, his new wife had a considerable influence on him. She softened him up. He used to be quite starchy and formal, but that once he had a wife who flung her arms around him and sat on his lap and tickled him, and that he did loosen up a lot, and he was more at ease with, with the press. I, I found him much easier to get on with. And I think she had a fantastic, she made a great, great difference to him. He was always a fun person to deal with, but he became much more relaxed. He used to put his arms around her and he used to put his hand on her derriere and things like that, which, you know, you wouldn't have seen him doing to, well, I mean, he didn't have a wife to do it to, but he did seem to be a lot less starchy, a lot less pompous when, once he was married. His joy at having a young and beautiful wife was very evident when he introduced Diana to an audience during their first tour of New Zealand. Ladies and gentlemen, the last time I was here was two years ago, uh, in 1981, shortly before uh, we were married. And uh, at that time, everybody was saying, good luck and I hope everything goes well and how lucky you are to be engaged to such a lovely lady. And my goodness, I was lucky enough to marry her. And uh, we had many, many messages. <laughs> Amazing what ladies do when your back's turned. <laughs> they were still the newlyweds, very much in love, reveling in all the attention, the living fairy tale of romance and glamour. Diana didn't just smarten up his dance style. Early in their marriage, she began to exert her will and influence on Charles in other ways. Royal tradition demanded that royal mothers leave their children at home, not for Diana. On the first overseas tour, the newly born Prince William went with his parents to the other side of the world. 
For the young princess, forced separation from her firstborn was out of the question, even in the line of duty. It provided a glorious photo opportunity for the world's press. William's birth had ensured the line of succession and fulfilled Charles's chief obligation of perpetuating the House of Windsor. The new role of fatherhood seemed to suit him. William obligingly played up for the cameras. These were happy times in a part of the world where Charles has always felt particularly relaxed and at home. If his official duties allowed it, he would choose to spend far more time down under. At 17, he'd been sent to Melbourne's prestigious Geelong Grammar School. Intended to provide another dimension to his education, it was his first experience of being judged solely on his own merits. He loves the fact that they, they treated him exactly the same as everybody else. He was made to do absolutely appalling jobs like um, cleaning out fly traps where they used to put rotten meat and things like that. It's very humbling, but it's good for the character. He likes the way Australians are a bit irreverent and their, their sense of humour, and that the way they'll take you down a peg or two, but they don't mean anything malicious by it. It's just, it's just their way of having fun. During the 1988 bicentenary celebrations in Sydney Harbour, Charles reminded his audience about the benefits of an Australian education. Many of you may not realise that part of my own education took place here in Australia. Quite frankly, it was by far the best part while I was here, I had the pommy bits bashed off me, <laughs> like chips off an old block, and the results are only too obvious. I keep coming back for more, and it is always a special pleasure. He, he enjoyed the fact that they treated him like a normal person. He couldn't get over how wonderful it was. And he talks uh, in interviews he's done about his years in Australia, about the wonderful shouts of pommy bastard and things once when he came in with an um, a furled umbrella. And when they shouted things like that at him, he knew they accepted him, that he was one of them, because they wouldn't say pommy bastard to him if they were in awe of him or if they felt that they had to mind their P's and Q's. Charles still finds the Australian attitude refreshing. If a fly needs waving away, he can always rely on them to sort it out. Thank you. <laughs> Charles has been Britain's roving ambassador for almost 20 years. There are few countries he hasn't visited. Non-political, his purpose is to maintain good relations, smooth ruffled feathers, indirectly promote British goods, and generally fly the flag. It is diplomacy at its highest and most subtle level. Charles brings his own distinctive brand of relaxed humor and questioning small talk onto a world stage. But with the arrival of Diana, he was no longer the lone diplomat and finally had someone to share the burden of gruelling overseas tours. They were soon an established, high-profile double act with an international reputation. She added a glamorous dimension to leaven his more heavyweight style, and for a while, this public partnership was a major success. On a personal level, Charles now had someone who could understand the difficulties of a life rigidly scheduled for months ahead. And he hates the feeling of being trapped. That is, he did say to us once at a cocktail party, he said, you can't imagine how awful it is for your whole life to be mapped out in front of you for two years in advance. He said, I know where I'll be next week, next month, next year. And it's just something that I think most of us have no concept of. We can't imagine how horrendous that is. And so that leaves him no freedom to suddenly say, oh, I think I'll go to the movies tonight. He can't do that because too many people would be let down if he did. As his marriage fell apart, Charles retreated more and more to Highgrove, his 700-acre country estate in Gloucestershire, and made it his main home and work base. Here, he enjoys the traditional pursuits of a country squire and also indulges his passion for gardening. Highgrove for him is his sanctuary. He's designed the whole part of the garden there with a series of little walkways and hedges and in the middle is this little hut or gazebo in which he sits with his typewriter writing his letters. And that is his world. And he there is the centre of his own universe. And it's a universe he's designed and he runs and he's in charge of. 
and that's where he's happiest, I think. Diana prefers London life and Kensington Palace. Highgrove has always been Charles's domain. It's, it's very beautifully decorated, except for one room, and that's his study, and that's because he decorated, he chose all the decorations of that, and that is a bit strange, to say the least. It's got kind of uh, rush matting on the floor, coir matting on the floor, and it's got tartan everywhere, mixed up with various sorts of prints, and it's very, very untidy. And so I think you don't expect that. You think that it would be very organised, but really what it reveals is a man who's, who's quite very busy, and quite disorganised. I mean, working on a million different projects at once, which is, that exactly sums him up. Much of his public work is focused on finding ways for young people to realise their own potential. Operation Raleigh launched 4,000 of them on a voyage of international cooperation, involving adventure, community projects and scientific research. It also illustrated Charles's genuine concern for the environment. He believes such cooperation is the key to preserving the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe the uh, tropical forests and the tropical rainforests in particular are the final frontier for humankind in more ways than one. Our efforts to protect them will not only determine the quality of life and economic security of future generations, but will test to the limit our readiness to cast off the kind of arrogance that has caused such devastating damage to the global environment and to become the genuine stewards of all life on Earth, not just the human bit of it. Charles has been lampooned and pilloried in various magazines and papers, but I think there is an element to him that really does care about environmental issues, about the state of the world. In fact, his earliest speeches when he was 18 and 19, if you go back and look at them, they were all on environmental matters, about overfishing of salmon and whales, about pollution in rivers and that sort of thing. He's very much someone who has been consistent all the way through. He's not leapt on the bandwagon. He was green before Thatcher even thought of the concept of being green. But in his private life, there are blatant discrepancies in this green vision. He maintains a luxurious lifestyle and doesn't always practice what he preaches. He'll go around lecturing everybody about lead in petrol or, or saving the, the, the planet. And then at the same time, he'll drive gas-guzzling cars and send them down to Highgrove when he's in London to pick up something he's forgotten. And he doesn't, it doesn't seem to occur to him that, that there's a, you know, a bit of a, a dichotomy here, you know, sending a, a big car down to pick up some carrots or something or a pen that he's left behind, when you know, that's costing an awful lot in pollution. Inner cities are another major concern in his public work. He's president of Business in the Community, a catalyst organisation encouraging large firms to help small schemes and community workshops. He doesn't believe in just throwing money at projects, but in helping people help themselves. Impatient with any kind of red tape, he unashamedly uses his royal status to leapfrog officialdom and involve those with the real power to get things moving. His main concern is to see practical results. He set up his own Prince's Trust to channel finance and advice through to young people in deprived areas. Again, his aim is to help them realise their own potential. For example, after 18 months without work, £1,500 from the Prince's Trust enabled these two girls to carry through an idea and set up a small printing business on their own. He gets enormous satisfaction from seeing people's confidence boosted by such individual achievements. But he is fully aware of how limited his efforts really are. The difficulty is how do you bring uh, hope uh, and, and, and some sort of inspiration to people who so often living in the sort of conditions and circumstances where there appears to be no, no hope at all. And, and although the, what the Prince's Trust can do is a mere pinprick, in comparison to the overall problem, I'd still believe that, uh, you know, even a little bit is better than nothing. Charles certainly doesn't run shy when it comes to controversy. Saying what he really thinks has often got him into hot water. In Hong Kong, people expected criticism when he opened the new cultural centre. I would uh, hardly be so tactless as to impart to you my views on the architectural design of this remarkable building. He hasn't always been so reticent. 
In 1987, he made the first of several attacks on architects by targeting plans for London's National Gallery. I would understand better this type of high-tech approach if you demolish the whole of Trafalgar Square and start it again. But what is proposed seems to me like a monstrous carbuncle on the face of a much loved and elegant friend. You have, ladies and gentlemen, to give this much to the Luftwaffe. When it knocked down our buildings, it didn't replace them with anything more offensive than rubble. We did that. He makes no excuses for using his speeches as weapons against things he dislikes. It's, after all, one of my rare opportunities to uh, stir things up, to um, throw a proverbial royal brick through the inviting plate glass of pompous professional pride and to jump feet first into the kind of spaghetti bolognese of red tape which clogs this country from one end to the other. I think the Prince of Wales has made some enemies in amongst the most powerful people in Britain. He has attacked, I mean look at the people he's attacked, the wealthy powerful institutions, he's attacked the architects, he's attacked the automotive industry, he's attacked the agrochemical industry, the peat producers, um, all sorts of people he has been getting under the skin of. And I think, I mean, these are powerful, rich and influential people. And I think it, they, I mean, they would dearly love to see him silenced. Now, there are several ways to do that. You either hire an assassin and shoot the man dead, or you smear him. You ridicule him. Charles's loony prince tag has stuck with him ever since he once admitted he liked talking to plants. At his 40th birthday party, he got his own back on the press by sending himself up at their expense. Only the other day, I was uh, inquiring uh, of an entire bed of um, old-fashioned roses who uh, were forced, forced to listen to my demented ramblings on, uh, on the meaning of the universe as I sat cross-legged <laughs> in the lotus position on the gravel paths in front of them. And I was inquiring of them what they thought would happen on my birthday in a Birmingham tram shed. Because he is such a good gardening expert, I wrote a story about him once when we were in, in Kenya together, and I was very mystified because he'd been in the market square talking to all the people selling vegetables, and every vegetable he picked up, he got the wrong name. So I wrote a funny piece saying he didn't know his onions and the buana was going bananas and all these puns and things, and he came up to me soon afterwards and said, I didn't like that story you wrote about me. Well, I, I was absolutely, you know, petrified. And, um, and I said, why not? And he said, well, you know, you, he, he, that he thought I was making out that he was a bit crazy. And I said, no, I was just having a bit of fun. And I looked so upset that he immediately changed to his tune and started to be quite apologetic for sort of attacking me about it. But um, when I, I told him that I was just trying to have a few feeble jokes, he saw the point and he, was, he quite enjoyed it too, you know. And I think he's got a very great sense of humour, which, which he says, if I didn't have it, I think I'd have gone mad in this job because it's such a stressful job. In Manchester, he accepted a practical joke with good grace, but then delighted in getting his revenge with the same shaving foam. On the James Bond set at Pinewood Studios, he grabbed the chance of trying out a fake bottle on the stuntman. but then quickly volunteered to be crowned by his wife with another one. <laughs> In these happier times, such staged acts of domestic violence were seen as a joke, the public face of a happily married couple ready to play the fool. But Charles is by nature more serious-minded. He's a deep thinker, and as an incorrigible romantic, was overwhelmed by his first views of Italy during a visit there with Diana in 1985. 
it was the start of a great love affair with the whole country. Its beauty and antiquity appealed to both his fascination with history and his passion for painting. He later chose Italy to host the first exclusive public exhibition of his own watercolours at Raphael's house in Urbino. I think Prince Charles is one of the last great romantics of the 20th century. He was probably born about 200 years too late. Uh, he really is a romantic. He likes to believe that things um, will happen as he wants them to happen, which is why he likes to go to Tuscany. He likes the, uh, the, the Tuscan hillsides. He likes the Italian way of life because it is a, a, a throwback to the old romanticism of the Middle Ages, if you like. Um, he likes to believe the best of people and he likes to really but genuinely believe the best of himself and he is a romantic in, in, in that shape or form. On his first visit, he spent every spare moment on Britannia's deck recording his impressions of Venice. Alone with his thoughts and paints, he was in his element. Meanwhile, his young wife was having to amuse herself at the other end of the royal yacht. Diana has little interest in either antiquities or painting. She wasn't immune to the beauty of Venice, but their basic divergence of interests was becoming more and more noticeable. Here, in one of the most romantic cities in the world, Charles's preoccupations were far too low-key for someone of Diana's generation. He himself said, uh, when he became engaged to uh, Lady Diana Spencer with a 12 or 13 year age gap that she will make me younger. She hasn't made him any younger. He's retreated into himself and has pursued middle-aged or elderly pastimes all his life. And this is one of the reasons why I think he likes to go so often into retreat in the highlands of Scotland where he can be entirely on his own and commune with nature and think about things. He likes to meditate. Meditation and philosophizing were all very well, but new influences were entering the royal family and bringing things very much more down to earth. With the arrival of Fergie, Duchess of York, two young wives began testing the rigid system of royal protocol. They tried a more relaxed attitude to press photo calls. Charles was definitely not amused by such undignified behavior in royal consorts. He believes that, that royalty must maintain a mystique. He feels that monarchy is important, that it must maintain its standards, that it, it, it has a, there's a very definite role for it in our society. He believes in the the ceremonial. He's a great believer in history. He, he, he draws on history and he sees himself as, as playing a part in a much longer process. Charles was born and bred for this historical role. Diana was not. The happy family image was still holding together for photo calls, but strains such as Diana's eating disorder, bulimia nervosa, were still hidden. With hindsight, their relationship had taken a definite turn for the worse. Something happened after the birth of Prince Harry. I don't know whether it was that she was suffering from postnatal depression or the bulimia uh, increased in a big way or what, but I think her uh, reaction to the pressure she was under the incredible spotlight, the relentless spotlight on her, the trauma of having two children quickly while coping with this fantastically stressful job and becoming the most famous woman in the world, all that took its toll on her. Perhaps he wasn't understanding enough or perhaps he just simply didn't have time because he's a very busy man. Perhaps he didn't appreciate, I, I think few people did in those days appreciate how bad the situation was because she smiled all the time when she was in public and she, she did such a good job at, at playing the role that nobody guessed how, how desperately she was sort of fighting to, uh, to, to keep her head above water. Die mania was also having a disruptive effect on their relationship. Diana now totally eclipsed Charles as the royal superstar everyone wanted to see. No one could have predicted such extreme adulation, and in all the excitement, he'd been relegated to a bit part. 
After a while, the fact that the crowds used to cheer Diana and, was, and, and groaned when he appeared wore a bit thin. And I remember one occasion when Diana was standing there, Prince Charles was standing there, a well-wisher was standing in the crowd with a camera and physically pushed Prince Charles out of the way so he could get a better picture of Diana. Now, for Prince Charles, who was long used to being the star of the Windsor Roadshow, to be usurped by somebody who, in royal terms, was very much a junior member, was very galling. And after a while, he became very jealous and he blamed Diana. And as one of Charles's former members of staff once said to me, it was rather like working for two pop stars, both rivals. Charles still had his macho image as the action man prince, but a polo accident suddenly left him an invalid for several months with a badly fractured arm. It was another blow to his pride. When he emerged from a second operation, the seriousness of the injury was obvious. He made no secret of his pain. How are you, sir? <laughs> Diana took over his public duties while he chose to recuperate away from her and his sons at Highgrove. During his long convalescence, a frequent visitor was someone he'd known since they were both in their mid-twenties and single, Camilla Parker Bowles. This fueled press revelations of a particularly close friendship. She was very much one of the chaps, very gung-ho, very gushing, keen to muck in on any sort of stunt and whatever. And I think Charles saw a kindred spirit there. And I think since her marriage to Andrew Parker Bowles, he sees that she's a safe friend and a safe confidant. Perhaps naively, he's thought that because she's happily married, has children and whatever, that he can be seen with her and can have her as a confidant, even an official escort, that uh, she can fulfill the role that Diana can't. Tabloid newspapers publish details from an alleged recording of a telephone conversation between Charles and Camilla. This confirmed years of speculation that the royal marriage was in trouble and made a mockery of the official projected image of Charles and Diana as a happily married couple. How long had the world been fooled by such carefully staged photo calls as those in the holiday sunshine of Spain? Many blamed Diana for the growing campaign of criticism against Charles. What I find disappointing about the coverage of the whole breakup of the marriage of the Prince and Princess of Wales is that is the inconsistency in the media. One month Diana is this dumb blonde the royal equivalent to Marilyn Monroe, the girl who uh, is as thick as two short planks. The next minute, she's been seen as the most manipulative, the most Machiavellian royal since Lucretia Borgia. Now, you can't have it both ways. And it strikes me that, it's the, that there's a degree of misogyny that, in the media, that there's a number of uh, newspaper editors, newspaper columnists, who hate the fact that a woman can try and find her own nature can reassert her own individuality in the face of uh, criticism from both the media and also from the palace establishment. And it shows the way that women are, in our society are suppressed and their emotional life repressed. Diana has never fitted in with Charles's horsey set. She prefers the city and would always head back as soon as she could. William and Harry have spent most of their time in London with their mother, and the media have used the fact that Charles hasn't seen much of his sons to brand him as an uncaring father. When William had to be rushed to hospital after an accident at school with a golf club, the press were again highly critical of his reaction. In their eyes, he showed only a cursory concern for his son's injury, leaving him in order to attend a public function after less than an hour. But Charles was there at William's birth, and becoming a father was an important event for him. From the start, he's taken far more interest in William and Harry's welfare than he's been given credit for. His pride and affection for his sons is very obvious, even in the staged atmosphere of photo calls. Notorious revelations engineered by his wife's friends. It's been the descriptions of him as a bad father that have cut most deeply. He could probably live with the things that were said about him because he knows the truth behind all that. But the fact that his children 
could one day read in a book that their mother allowed such appalling things to be said about him, that he was an uncaring father, that he neglected them. I think that's, that was really, really hurtful to him. That was probably plunging the knife and twisting it. It really was, because I'm utterly convinced he, he loves his children really, really devotedly, and he spends a great deal of time with them. And none of this is ever publicised, because he wouldn't wish it to be. He doesn't want to exploit his children. This book has done untold damage. I think, I mean, Diana was, is a perfect princess, a brilliant princess. It didn't matter what was going on in their private life because we didn't know about it. We didn't need to know about it. I think we have now, uh, there's a chink in the armour. We've seen into their lives. We've seen that they are actually just ordinary people underneath it all. The emperor has no clothes. And I think that is dangerous. It's now plain that Charles married the wrong woman. He would undoubtedly have been happier with someone like Camilla. But when Diana appeared, his own sense of honour and duty finally convinced him to accept her as his bride. The sheer weight of public opinion was impossible to resist. We coerced him into marrying her, that we, the media and the nation, the world, we said, here's this girl, she's so perfect, she's so suitable, you must marry her. She's wonderful. We all raved about her, we all publicised her highly. And he's so gallant that it got to the stage where if he had then dropped her, it would have been so humiliating for her that it was almost out of his hands, that he couldn't really say, well, uh, you know, uh, he couldn't express that he was not certain about the marriage because we were all constantly bombarding him day after day with this news, this girl is terrific, we want her. You know, it was almost like the nation demanding that he marry her. And being a good chap, he did. And the rest, as they say, is history. Two of the Queen's sons married commoners. Fergie had already gone, and there was growing speculation that Diana would follow. The wedding of Lady Helen Windsor was an opportunity for a show of family unity. It was the first time Charles and Diana had been seen together since the media revelations. But despite the apparent cordiality, it was all a sham. In reality, their lawyers were already negotiating separation terms, and their vows, taken in St Paul's Cathedral 11 years earlier, had lost all meaning. Prince Charles spoke often about what he wanted from marriage. He wanted a companion, he wanted someone to f fulfil a role, somebody to perform duties. As far as he was concerned, love, affection, uh, came very much with very much secondary considerations. He wanted a partner to fulfill a function. There's no doubt that Diana fulfills the role of Princess of Wales to perfection and knows it. When the crowd calls, she comes. Breaking ranks from the other royals, she takes the time to stop and chat, and her sons follow her example. She sees her future in terms of grooming William for taking up his eventual role as king. Charles's own future is far less certain. The smart money would be eventually on a, on a divorce and Charles remaining uh, a, a divorcee with possibly female companions such as Camilla Parker Bowles by his side. That's, that's one scenario. Another one would be that uh, they would remain separated at least f for a decade, decade or so. At the moment, the situation could only be best be characterised as one of unstable equilibrium. No first son has ascended the British throne since Edward VII nearly a hundred years ago. The last Prince of Wales was forced to abdicate due to problems in his personal life. Now Charles's private circumstances may never be deemed worthy of a monarch. Separation and the possibility of future divorce and even remarriage may ultimately cut him off from his destiny. If his mother remains queen for another 25 years, Charles will be in his 60s and his son, William, a younger and perhaps more acceptable heir to the throne. After a lifetime of waiting, Charles's tragedy is that he could be just another Prince of Wales who will never become king.